Well, good evening. Um, the urbanization of the suburbs in post-industrial metropolitan regions is a pretty familiar theme by now. Um, it's been current at least since Joel Garreau's popular book, Edge Cities, was published in 1991. And I think it's also fair to say that the Metro Vancouver region, perhaps as much as any North American city, exemplifies this trend. With high-density, mixed-use, transit-oriented centres housing a diverse population springing up all over the place, in such places as Metrotown and Brentwood and Burnaby, Richmond Centre, Lower Lonsdale on the North Shore, Port Moody, Coquitlam Centre, New West, and yes, also Surrey. Uh, these images on the screen here show the city centre area, or as it was called in those days, Wally, in 1971, and also shows the city's plan for this same area, as we hope it to be in 2041. We're some of the way between these two images as I speak. But in the next few minutes, I want to drill down and focus on some of the urban design elements of this transformation of the suburban landscape, and particularly on the very pragmatic, day-to-day -day challenges of reshaping entrenched patterns or archetypes that characterize places like Surrey. And I'll posit that the result of this reshaping will be a new hybrid kind of urban place with features of suburban and classically urban character mixed and juxtaposed in surprising and sometimes even jarring ways for many years, perhaps decades. And that this will be the shape of the working city, the setting for many people's lived urban experience. And I have to tell you, this is not a bad place to work as a planner. This transformation is exciting and challenging. But first, a few contextual points about Surrey. First, the city is growing steadily and continuously at a rate of about 1,000 new residents per month, 10,000, 12,000 per year. And we're planning then for an additional 300,000 residents to join the 520,000 already here over the next 30 years. Second point is this population is very diverse. Surrey is an arrival city, to use Doug Saunders' term, a primary destination of new immigrant populations and government-assisted refugees, among others. The third point is that the city has pockets and districts of quite high net population density, and not only in its high-rise core, but in many neighbourhoods of detached housing and packed townhouses as well. I think it was Michael Geller, may have made the, or it was Mike Harcourt, one of those folks, said there's no such thing as a, as a single-family house in this region anymore, and that's true in Surrey as well. The detached houses often have one, two, three semi-legal, illegal, partly legal, secondary, tertiary suites in the basement. As Patrick said, the schools in many neighbourhoods in Surrey are literally bursting at the seams. Uh, the fourth point is that Surrey is a primary location for delivering the region's relatively affordable family and workforce housing. The challenge of urban design in this context is to reshape the spatial containers within which and into which this rapidly growing diverse population is moving, and to create healthy, more walkable, transit-supportive, and yes, beautiful neighbourhoods and centres along the way. But here's the rub. Anyone who studies cities knows that the patterns of streets and blocks and even lots are extremely persistent over time. And you can often trace these patterns in older cities over hundreds of years. Reshaping patterns is not easy work. These patterns are inscribed in the landscape and short of scraping everything clean and starting again, outside of False Creek is rarely possible, these patterns will necessarily form the foundational blueprint of this newly emerging city. So I want to show a number of um, archetypes. Uh, it's an incomplete selection, but suburban archetypes that form these patterns and that illustrate the scope of the challenge of reshaping. All of these images are, are actual images um, of, uh, of the city of Surrey, different parts. These archetypes, suburban archetypes, include the cul-de-sac subdivision, which limits the potential of connectivity within and between neighbourhoods and also limits infill development to a great degree. There are no back lanes for back lane housing here. It's a challenging operation to infill. And then there's the arterial road, whose wide grid spacing, often a half mile or even a mile apart, 
means that it has a heavy traffic lifting role, which often prevents on-street parking and therefore viable high street urbanism along these main arterials. Then there's the fabled strip mall, which paradoxically both limits fine-grained main street urban frontages, but also frustrates comprehensive redevelopment through a fractured ownership pattern. And as Patrick Cotter will talk about later, uh, the difficulty of, of redevelopment because they're generating rents. Then there's the strata superblock, sometimes 10 acres or more, with a form of tenure, strata form of ownership, that makes incremental redevelopment of these sites virtually impossible. Then there's the trailer park, large, potentially strategic redevelopment sites that are often under single ownership and along major transit corridors. Excellent sites for redevelopments, right? But that also house our most vulnerable populations with very limited relocation options. People who are living in the most affordable owned accommodation in the lower mainland. Governments uh, don't like uh, to be the heavy and displace uh, these vulnerable populations. And maybe it's not a good idea to do so. And then, of course, there's the regional shopping mall, internalized and surrounded by its sea of parking lots locked in through long-term lease agreements. So reworking this raw material, reshaping it to create walkable, less car-dependent, more livable, more sustainable places is challenging work. And it implies a set of urban design strategies that are tailored to this context and not necessarily the context of a place like the city of Vancouver. These urban design strategies, dare I say it, may diverge from the orthodoxy of contemporary urban design theory. So I only have time to tease you with a couple of these, but these strategies may include what you might call superblock urbanism, an urbanism that works to achieve a finer grain of public streets and pedestrian networks, but only in the context of project viability, exemplified here in two Surrey projects that I think show our progress in this regard over the last 15 years. The bottom images, the gorgeous, fantastic, and wonderful Bing Tom designed SFU Central City uh, development. It was a, a, a catalyst of development in the city of Surrey, replacing and, and really squatting on top of the old Surrey Place Mall. And then on the top image, the more recent King George Station development, which is under construction uh, by PCI with um, uh, consulting by uh, Muss and Cattell Architects. The second strategy may be what I'd call an urban island strategy, concentrating on achieving a high quality of design at the project and public realm scale, but being, can I say it, more relaxed and flexible about where this density lands within reason, accepting that these islands will grow together over time, filling in the interstitial areas that are more resistant uh, to redevelopment at this time. And then finally, a third strategy, which I don't think we do that well yet in Surrey, are policies that would permit a wide application of incremental redevelopments, what I would call mom-and-pop redevelopment, particularly in transit-served inner ring neighborhoods and along arterial roads, where we could be more flexible about uses and allow a smaller scaled options or smaller scale density options that don't require large uh, land assemblies and underground parking. So these strategies, among others, may allow for a new and very different city form to emerge, a hybrid form that may be somewhat messy, but that provides for dynamic market and cultural forces to reshape the city, the city that's increasingly home to the economic and social lifeblood of our, of our urban region. So thank you, and I look forward to further conversation after my colleagues speak. <laughs>